All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, just My name is Laurent Dubois. I just want to welcome you here today um, and to open this event. This will uh, be going on all day today. Um, we're starting with a, uh, a lecture by Jean Williams. We're really delighted to have you here. Um, Jean Williams is the leading global scholar of women's football. Um, she's faculty head of research and students of, for art, design, and humanities, and deputy head of the sports history research group at De Montfort University in England and is the author of a huge number of articles and four books about uh, this topic. A Game for Rough Girls from 2003, A Beautiful Game from 2008, which we read here in my class, Globalizing Women's Football from 2013, and most recently, The Contemporary History of Women's Sport, Part 1. Um, so what Jean will be helping us do today is kind of set the stage for the, all the conversations today with both historical perspective and institutional analysis. So um, the events being live streamed will have pe people reach, uh, watching online and tweeting things as well. So we'll incorporate them into the conversation as we can. So, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, thank you for that in introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me here today. It's great to share this occasion with so many other scholars uh, uh, who have written about women's football and um, we've already had many lively debates over dinner last night. Um, I think perhaps with the people we have in the room we could possibly have a conference just on Malta or um, <laughs> uh, just on Birgit Prince or who, whoever. So um, it's, uh, it's a really nice occasion uh, and I think it's a significant occasion uh, I was saying last night that um, I haven't been invited to a conference solely on women's football since 2005 when the Women's Euros were hosted um, in England. Um, although I have been invited to UEFA and FIFA conferences, they are not academic in tone, they have a very different tone, which is very much uh, one, one which I want to address today. So, um, broadly, the the presentation seeks to give an introduction, but also a hope to raise a few debates um, that we can take forward. And I'm not going to speak for the full hour, uh, as I'd like it to be more interactive. So um, I'm going to raise some issues rather than answer a lot of issues, but obviously happy to talk about any, any aspect of the history of women's sport, uh, and particularly football. So um, just wanted to start with this then. This is a kind of cultural artifact of women's football um, and to reflect on it and to think about what it actually might mean. When Panini Stickers issued this edition of the Women's World Cup 2000 in Germany, it was hailed by many as progress and an important first. It's a theme that we hear very often within women's football. Like Hope Solo appearing on Dancing with the Stars, the Panini range was considered an encouraging sign that women's football was finally moving beyond sport into the cultural industries. But what appeared to be first um, can also be indications of much longer continuities. So are they really markers of progress? And one of the things that I would like us to debate today is what is the nature of progress and what does that mean? Should we also be considering how continuity can be as important as change. How does change differ from progress? And what role does history play in authenticating sport? So this presentation has two sections, a historical overview and a more contemporary discussion. Um, it first of all questions the narrative of women's soccer making constant progress. Uh, and the first il elements illustrate some of what we know about the history of women's involvement in the game of association football from 1863 when the FA was formed. And I am I'm mindful today that my comments don't really speak to the other codes of football, <coughs> rugby union, rugby league, American football and so forth. And again, one of the things I think we could explore later in our discussions are the continuities between different kinds of football and indeed uh, with, with other sports. I'm going to leave the historical uh, element at the point at which the FA banned women's football in 1921. This was a ban only in England, but I'm going to argue it had a disproportionate effect on the image and history of women's football across the world. I also want to draw uh, and, and share some of the problems in using historical material to draw conclusions. 
Um, and so I've, I've got at the back of the, the room some examples of how women's football passed into popular culture, both in terms of the football favourite, which was a magazine that was aimed at youths, um, say between the ages of 12 and early 20s in England. Um, not just the times when women's football was included on the cover of that magazine, but the way in which it was serialised and became narrativised uh, in, uh, in stories about the women footballers. Uh, the second part of the presentation is designed for those who are conducting research who, or who would like to conduct uh, more recent research into what has been called the women's game. And again, I'm mindful throughout this whole presentation that I'm using language that is problematic. It's language that I myself have said is problematic, and yet I'm using it today as a kind of shorthand. So, um, uh, again, very happy to talk about these linguistic problems and difficulties. Um, that, the, the more contemporary section focuses on my more recent work on migration and forms of professionalism in the women's game as a way of showing how academic work can have applied policy outcomes. It's quite a reach, actually, for a lot of historical work to have any um, uh, uh, resonance with FIFA and UEFA. Nevertheless, I have been uh, funded by both of those organisations and just to show how uh, it's possible to uh, tweak uh, academic historical work um, to, to have sort of policy outcomes. So the presentation just begins with a very simple question then. Um, <clears throat> historically, what percentage of all football at what levels of performance has involved women and girls? Seems like a very simple question, but it's a question that we will never have the answer to. Nevertheless, it doesn't stop us researching the topic, and it's one of the big challenges in this uh, research agenda. We do not know uh, uh, how many there have been, and I guess we don't fully know how many there are now. If you look at FIFA estimates of, of women's football, they're very happy to tell you now that up to 30 million women worldwide play football. But these are guesstimates based on um, uh, ways of calculating those figures that include people who intend to play football in the next year, as well as people who are actually registered players. So whenever we look at FIFA estimates of how many women actually play, we have to be very cautious with those, with, with those figures. Um, and similarly, uh, a lot of the national associations are very interested in telling the story of constant progress, of the rise and rise of women's football. Um, it's very rare to hear a national association go to a conference and say, actually our numbers have dipped, we're not doing so well as we did last year, um, because it's in their interest to tell this story of, of constant so-called um, progress. Um, one of the things that is also problematic if you, if you are going to research this topic is that academic writing on association football tends to fall along gendered lines set by the sports governing bodies. So sometimes uh, academics who write on male football, which is very rarely called, um, don't feel the need to uh, address issues within women's football. Um, if I give an example of a, a journalist who I helped recently, who's writing, he's, he's got very interested in uh, the history of the Women's World Cup, and I helped him a little bit with the material and gave him an outline of uh, the history of the Women's World Cup, and uh, as, as a way of thanking me for that, he mansplained uh, who Gianluca Viali was, because of course being a historian of women's football, I would not know. Um, you get an awful lot of that. So since 1998, I've been writing to reclaim some of the forgotten history of women's enthusiasm for football, but also to challenge meetings such as this uh, to more fully incorporate a diverse agenda when considering what we're talking about when we're talking about the history of association football. Uh, so please be aware that I'll be using football and soccer interchangeably, uh, and although as a form of shorthand I'll use terms like women's football and the women's game, I think this use of language and terminology is itself problematic. And, and again, very, very happy to, to return to that. Uh, I don't know how many people will have seen this particular image. Um, this is a, a team known as Bridget's Eleven. We know something of them uh, due to family and oral history. Um, 
but not, not an awful lot. And one of the things I wanted to highlight today is that photographs are problematic sources. It's, it's a theme to which I'll return. Uh, and I think this is just a really interesting image. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, where uh, FIFA actually take charge of women's football and host the first women's world championships. They didn't give it a World Cup title in 1991. This, they thought, was the uh, image that would represent women's football. And I think it's a really interesting image to uh, pick. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the historiography of football has tended to neglect women's contribution to the sport based on the gendered labour markets that have structured the amateur game after the formation of the Football Association in 1863 and the professional game since the mid-1880s. We know that FIFA was formed in 1904, but remained a relatively poor organisation until it saw the success of the 1928 Olympic tournament uh, as an opportunity to form its own lucrative World Cup competition. And I just wanted to present this here to you today to show that we have an outline of some of the key dates in women's football. Um, but I also want to highlight how provisional this outline is, that um, this is being revised and challenged and changed all the time. My presentation today is very much uh, intended to highlight the cultural history of women's football. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to um, say is that this is something that is not always enthusiastically backed by the governing bodies of sport. Because obviously women's football developed outside of the structures of the FA and FIFA until very late on in the 20th century. So they're not interested in the history, and actually they would have you believe the history of it very much began when they took over. Um, nevertheless, nevertheless, this neglects almost 100 years of history. So we're talking about essentially an unregulated um, activity that, that had commercial links, uh, very much grounded in local communities and networks, civil communities and so forth. I don't know if any of you have ever visited Manchester in England, have you? Uh, if you have, you'll know that they uh, house the wonderful um, National Football Museum. Uh, and if you ever do go to Manchester, please visit the National Football Museum. It's a fantastic triangle because you have the National Football Museum, you have Harvey Nicks, and you have Selfridges. So, you know, it's a very nice way to um, spend, spend a day. Um, and one of the things I tried to do with the museum director there, uh, Kevin Moore, is to get some funding. We tried in 1999 and we tried again in 2005. Because I have an awful lot of material that I've collected over the years by going to people's homes uh, and, and to various other places, car boot sales, um, uh, in order to collect the history of women's football. And we wanted to put it online for researchers. And both times the National Lottery funding turned us down. They said, well, there's no audience for this. Nobody's interested. So there is a private collector. If I could just highlight. Uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in the history of women's football, um, this guy is um, a national treasure. Uh, oh, no, not that one. Sorry. Yes, this one. Uh, th this guy is a national treasure in, in England. His name is Patrick Brennan, and he's done what, what I should have done and what I attempted to do with the National Football Museum, which is to put all of this material online. So if you are interested in researching it, then <clears throat> you, know, you can go and look at the actual newspaper reports of the matches in 1881 for what appears to be the first um, organised uh, match between two teams. They were, called, um, they were called Scotland in England. They weren't two representative teams. They were called Scotland in England because England has a long rivalry with Scotland and it was a way of getting local supporters to pay and come down and, and, and to, to see the match. Actually, when we um, look at what happened between the two teams, players later swapped sides and continued to play England-Scotland. So they definitely weren't representative. Um, Anybody with Scottish heritage here? 
we'll be pleased to know that uh, the, the Scots were. Um, uh, and you know, we have semi-match reports from this, and we know that there was co things like combined play and things that we might expect. So um, yeah, re really valuable resource. And in fact, if we could just scroll to the top again of the of the website, if you go, could you go to women's football? Click on women's football for me. Uh, you know, it's like, it's not exactly an A to Z, but whatever you need to know about these particular teams, um, Patrick Brennan has, has, has put that up there. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful resource. Okay, so I'm going to go back to... Yeah. However, uh, the increasing academic study of the sport and of football as part of the wider cultural and entertainment industries is now beginning to nuance this picture. And one of the things that I wanted to say today is, um, having done this since 1998, you, you, you will sometimes um, see um, women's football research fatigue upon my face. Because <laughs> trying, you know, trying to take the story out to the world uh, is, can, is pretty tiring and, and can be um, pretty weary. One of the things that is incredibly encouraging um, and, and is absolutely great that I've seen since 1998 is the variety and complexity of research that is now going on around women's football. Um, when I first started researching in 1998, the single most frequent question I was asked by people when I attended football conferences is, why do women want to play football? Isn't there other stuff they can do? And it was almost like the implication of at least please leave our football pure from women. Um, thankfully, I don't get asked that question so much now. Uh, and there, there are a growing body of scholars who have done really interesting and cutting edge work and also really diverse work. So I think that is something that, that is, a, is a sign of progress uh, and, and is very encouraging for the future. So still working on this chronology, adding little bits here and adding little bits there, uh, and quite an exciting find saying for quite a long time that I thought that the first organised women's match was 1881, England v Scotland. Um, this collector, if I could just show the website, um, has some interesting new information from the 1860s. Um, and could you click on, excuse me, could you click on 1800s for me? Yeah, and scroll down. So, yeah, if we could just stop there, yeah. Just before we get to the caption. Very interested to see what you think you see here. Shall I turn the lights down? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. It's just the one on the far left. Far left. <clears throat> it's a duchess. <laughs> <laughs> it's royalty. A football playing duchess. <laughs> As historians, how would you approach this? What is it evidence of? Classism. The short answer is I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answers to this. I'm, I'm reading it along with you. Is that a swing um, in the background? Say again? In the background. Is that a swing set? That's sort of trying to yeah. place the location, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know. It's I great. don't. They're having fun. It's like what women do all the time. Go and kick around. Yeah, but wouldn't it also be, I mean, the costuming of the ladies just in, the, have, in the left, she's right? showing the lot of that, wouldn't <laughs> that be very scandalous? Oh. Every time. That up? So are we, are we looking at, at, at duchesses and tarts? Duchesses versus tarts. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if that plays into the new atmosphere. We're game this afternoon. I have no idea. I have no idea how to read this image. Would this have been funny? Because it's like they're very, they're fit, very physical. Like yeah. the the one yeah. with her back turned towards us is, you know, is um um sho you know shoving that woman backwards. Like you know, like. It's it's an un, it's unusual for its physicality more than anything I would think in terms of I don't know when I've seen 
an illustration from this period of grown women, because they're also adults, they're not children, like playing like this. And, and what's on the rest of the page? Well, that's oh, it, yeah, it, it, yeah. You just scroll down to the caption. So um, this is, uh, it was in Harper's Bazaar, and of course, as an illustration, we don't even know that this ever took place. Right, right. So it, it's perhaps almost a reach too far to say, right, you know, I would love to say this is the first, this is evidence of a women's football match from 1869. Mm. Of course, I'm dying to say that, but I think you have to be very careful about saying that, particularly because it's in Harper's Bazaar. Um, we don't know that it represents any actual event. Without doing a little bit more, we don't really know too much about it. But we do know that the idea of we, women playing football was either controversial enough or topical enough yeah. that it passed into popular culture. And that is the, that is the kind of significant element. Um, I will just show a couple more things, if, if you wouldn't mind just scrolling down a little bit more. Um, if we could just stop there. A lot of you will know the story of Lady Florence Dixie, the president of the first British Ladies Football uh, uh, Association, uh, the non-playing president with Nettie Honeyball, the secretary, we now think is an alias for a more middle-class woman who actually wanted to play. Um, and actually, again, if you go back and and sort of cross-reference this with Patrick Brennan's website, they played, over, British Ladies Football Club played over 100 matches, some of them as Mrs Graham's 11. So it was a significant um, cultural achievement. And I think we have to sometimes look outside of football, also thinking about what was going on in other sports, like for example swimming, where women could move between the sports industries and the entertainment industries. From the music halls onto the sports field and into, uh, in the case of swimming, into the rivers. And these were different sites where women would become entrepreneurs and try and make a little bit of money, albeit on, uh, entrepreneurs that were maybe penny entrepreneurs, a little bit of money. Uh, nothing like the Football League at this time. <laughs> but, but you can start to see continuities with other, with other sports. And just the last thing on this page, if we could just scroll down a little bit more. Again, yeah, that's it. Talking about um, talking about women's football passing into popular culture and cultural history, we're starting to find more and more of these examples where, how do you interpret these? Little trinkets maybe to take home? Or something to commemorate a match? <coughs> They seem quite cheap, so I can't imagine that there'd be anything that people might collect. Um, and it might be part of that sort of penny entrepreneurial um, aspects of, of women's football at this time. So developing outside and away from the uh, organisation of the FA. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, in going down that route, I just wanted to highlight um, the rich resources that there are out there, but they are not at present collected in any one particular museum. The National Football Museum in, um, in Manchester houses what is called the FIFA collection, which is perhaps the uh, most significant collection on association football anywhere in the world. And they're starting to become aware of more of this women's football memorabilia, but there are huge amounts still uh, that remain to, to be done. Okay, um, few popular or academic historians now write about the history of World War I without acknowledging the dramatic changes in women's lives that the con conflict caused. <coughs> Increasingly, the effect of the conflict and ensuing peace on European women's sport and leisure are receiving the attention that they deserve. Football and its connections with the breakaway separatist women's Olympic Games, led by Alice Millier, uh, are among the more well-researched topics, but much more remains to be done. So one of the things that I've tried to highlight in my most recent work is football did not, women's football didn't develop in isolation. Um, they were part of the first Women's World Games organised by Alice Millier in Monte Carlo in 1921. And it became a, a significant part of that process. So... Um, we get a gradual history, 
hopefully going back to 1869, but very provisionally, uh, but, but a real burst of interest um, during World War I. One of the problems around that, and I include myself in this, is that there is a huge amount still to do. So uh, just thought that I would, again, tell that story through three images. Um, this woman is my personal hero. Um, Lily Park, born in 1905 as the fourth of seven children of a labourer in St Helens, Liverpool. Lily Parr joined the Dick Kerr ladies football team in the 1920-21 season and immediately scored 43 goals in that first season. Uh, she, Dick Kerr sorry, played 828 matches, won 758, drew 46 and lost only 24. In that time they scored more than 3,500 goals and Parr scored around 1,000 of them during her career. The team drew large crowds and in December 1920, a match against St Helens Ladies, which Parr side won 4-0, attracted a crowd of 53,000 at Goodison Park. So the next time that somebody says to you, and somebody somewhere will say this to you, <laughs> uh, the next time somebody says to you, um, well, nobody will pay to watch women's football, I hope that you will remind them of Dick Kerr Ladies and the 150 other teams that were playing at around this time. And one of the things that I haven't done, that I should have done, um, but I'm maybe going to leave it to somebody else to do now, is to do more research on those 150 teams. Because we only know a very little about Lily Parr. We know a little bit about her teammates. We know very little about the, the other 150 teams. What we do know is that Parr was paid 10 shillings per week and travel expenses, which would be around £100 in today's money. Um, what? $150. Uh, Parr continued to play with Dick Kerr Ladies, later renamed Preston Ladies, until 1951. It was an epic playing career, and like those of us who have played to an advanced age, she began as a very fast left winger. She then moved into the centre. She then moved into defence. She ended up in goal. Um, <laughs> after leaving the Dick Kerr and Co factory, Parr trained as a nurse at Whittington... Whittingham Mental Health Facility and continued to play football while working at the hospital. Now this is absolutely fascinating because they were all munitions workers who were made redundant and then had to retrain as mental health nurses in order to continue to support themselves, which Lily Parr did. Um, and through this combination of football and nursing, um, she became the first person in her family to own her own home. And I think this is a form of professionalism that cannot be underestimated. That would have been a significant achievement for somebody of, of her uh, class and background. Pa died at the age of 73 of breast cancer and is buried in St Helens near to her sister's grave. But what I pre presented pretty much is what we know about her. The myths around her are much more extensive than the facts. So again, there's much more research um, to be done. There's a myth that uh, shooting in uh, against a male team once, she had a shot hard enough to break the goalkeeper's arm. I, I've searched for newspaper evidence of this, but never been able to, to find it. It is said that she um, uh, was so poor, that there's a saying in England that people are so poor that they think cutlery is jewellery. And uh, when she went to a lot of fancy houses for the dinners after the games, she would um, <clears throat> take the silver with her and, and would, would sell it off later. And similarly, the match ball was often, uh, because of a lot of the games were played for charity, the match ball was often um, uh, auctioned off at the end of the match. But because these were quite expensive items worth about 10 shillings, very often Lily Carr would um, take the ball as well. So there are lots of myths about her and... Um, uh, uh, she does seem to have been a, a, a larger than life character. That's the woman that we know about. This photograph um, I was given by somebody who got it at uh, a car boot sale. So she paid like five pence for it. And all that we know about this woman is that her name was Doris 
Well, that's what's written on the back of the photograph anyway. And that she played for Hanley ladies. So trying to reconstruct the lives of these players and why, why was she playing and in what context and what communities and networks was she part of remains to be a significant challenge. Um, yeah. And finally, this, this is an image that was in the uh, newspaper when the FA banned women's football in 1921. So after the huge popularity of these early games during World War I, the FA stipulated that too much money was being absorbed in expenses by the players and that um, uh, clubs affiliated to the Football Association of Football League should not allow women to play on their grounds anymore. And that stopped at a stroke this ability for women's football to collect very large audiences, present a playing spectacle, very often involving some of the uh, leading entertainers or um, sports people of the day, and get a paying crowd to give over lots of money. And, and what I'd just like to do is pause now in the PowerPoint and just show you a very quick film. It's only 38 seconds, I'm afraid, um, of what it actually looked like at the time. Georges Carpentier had been the um, uh, world boxing champion. So this was significant that he would kick off a, a women's football match. Look at, you can see the crowds waiting for gorgeous George to kick off. So, so we know, in drawing this section to a close, we know that these were working men who paid week in, week out to go and watch women's football. Uh, this is often explained away as a part of the circumstances of war, but my point uh, that I always raise in connection with that is women's football was more popular after World War I than during it. Ditkers didn't begin until 1917. So had there not been a ban, then it's likely that they would have continued to draw ever larger uh, crowds. And, and the point that I want to make today is that that changed football. It didn't just change women's football, it changed the nature of football. Uh, the ban was only instituted by the English FA, but it was absorbed by the Scottish, Welsh and Irish FA. And... Um, Certain countries never did take part in the ban on women's football, uh, like France never really did. Um, and later, after World War II, you get um, the newly constituted DFB, the West German uh, Football Association, issuing bans. So it, it's kind of piecemeal across national associations. The significant thing and the story that most people around the table here know today is that um, the ban was largely in place until 1969. It was that late when FIFA decided to take over women's football. I found letters in the archive from a guy, uh, a T. Cranshaw, um, who travelled through the United States in 1956 and he was very annoyed. He wrote uh, a letter to FIFA saying, I have seen women playing football in the United States on my travels and I have heard that there are up to 20,000 women playing football. FIFA, what are you going to do about it? FIFA's response was, we're not going to do anything about it because we don't recognise women's football, it's not under our jurisdiction, it's not under our control, um, it's nothing to do with us. Uh, and what develops in the 1960s is, is uh, a thing that I've characterised as a policy tension within FIFA's position. It wanted to be the world governing body of the sport, and yet it didn't want to recognise women's football. Certain businessmen become involved, and this happens all, all over the world. Um, in Hong Kong, um, the wonderful Veronica Chen, uh, forms the Hong Kong Ladies Football Association in 1965 
and begins basically a letter writing campaign to the Asian Football Confederation, to FIFA, to the press, to anyone who will listen. Um, and Veronica Chen is still with us. Uh, I think she's 90. Um, uh, and, and I think she's going to be interviewed for this article, uh, the, the guy who I was speaking about, the, the journalist who's interested in the history of Women's World Cup. Um, and she estimates across her lifetime that she's put several hundreds of thousands of her own money into promoting women's football. Um, and when the Asian Ladies Football Confederation would not accept women's football in its confederation, she forms the Asian Ladies Football Confederation and tries to affiliate direct FIFA. All of this manoeuvring goes on for years and years and years, and eventually that situation, the professional leagues in Italy, uh, <coughs> some of what is happening in South America, and some of what is happening uh, elsewhere in Europe, forces FIFA to say, OK, we will become the, the world governing body for football and we will accept women's football. They then decide not to do much about it for quite a long time. Um, and there are con congresses and conferences at which it's discussed and put off and put off. And it's not really until 1986 that things really radically begin to change within FIFA. Um, a chance for a Women's World Cup is passed up in England in 1975 because, believe it or not, sponsors are involved and women's football has to be amateur. Um, it was Viner's uh, cutlery manufacturers, and they were willing to sponsor the tournament to the tune of £50,000. Um, and that was thought to be not the right future for women's football because they didn't want it to be too commercial. It needed to be protected and amateur. And indeed, several of the women who um, played, uh, I interviewed Sue Lopez, for example, who played in the Italian leagues. Uh, she's English, but she played in the Italian professional leagues in the early 1970s. She was very care careful to keep her amateur status because when England then formed the first international squad in 1972, she was eligible to play for her country. And she had to choose a professional future in Italy or an amateur future as an England player. And being very patriotic, she came back to England uh, and, and, and did that. So <clears throat> FIFA become interested in the 70s, get a little bit more interested in the 80s, and um, 1991 we have the first Women's World Cup. And that's really what I want to talk about in this, in, 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 in this next section. Um, my comments on this uh, uh, are, are uh, informed by a, a UEFA-funded research project to look at migration into and out of Europe. So I apologise in presenting this to a, a mainly American audience, but it, it's one of the ways to get funded. If they're the European uh, Confederation, they want to know that it's more about Europe. And some of that is political because they can't seem to be looking at world football because that's FIFA's job. So I had to really focus down on um, European football. Um, and I chose two main themes for that work. Firstly, the growing transna transnational migration of female professional players into and out of Europe from the 1950s onwards, when private business interests demonstrated the growth in the women's game. Uh, also have to contextualise that by saying that football was an important game and industry in Europe after 1945 because of its increasingly global reach. Uh, Roland Robertson has defined globalisation as a concept that refers both to the compression of the world and the intensification of consciousness of the world as a whole. And you can start to see that happening in football and you can start to see it happening to some extent within women's football. Um, however, still today, not all nationalist football associations affiliated to FIFA promote football for girls and women and no national football association in the world provides equal support for its men's and women's national teams, not even the US, Norway or Germany. If you're talking, show me the money, you know, show, show me the dollars in terms of support. And in fact, if you look at the, the evidence from the Women's World Cups, it's quite apparent that national associations will form great, great squads, squads that win uh, tournaments that win cups like uh, happened with the um, Chinese uh, national team in the under 20 Women's World Cup and um, they just got home and they were just disbanded. So 
logically, if you're thinking about the development of sport, you keep that squad together because it bodes well for the next Women's World Cup. But actually, it's very short-termist thinking, uh, just to save a, a little bit of money. Something that's significant that we have to recognise in that, though, is that the nature of FIFA and UEFA and the football confederations change from 86 to now. It's not like women's football is changing and these, these people are standing still. Those institutions have changed radically, uh, particularly uh, 86 to 88. Uh, and very often in this, Haviland is presented uh, as a visionary for wanting to include women's football and a Women's World Cup tournament. He is the man, it's given down to him to have had this uh, vision for the future of women's football. Actually, it wasn't like that at all. It was um, a woman, Ellen Will, who stood up from the floor of a FIFA Congress uh, in 1985 and challenged FIFA to have a Women's World Championship because there had already been uh, world championships in um, cricket um, and in rugby. So, in a way, this is part of the um, policy challenges for FIFA. They were seen to be um, behind the curve, and they were seen to be conservative, and they knew they needed to change, even though they didn't really want to change. Um, they've also changed rad radically as administrative bodies. So um, UEFA in the early 60s maybe had three full-time staff. <coughs> now if you go to their very glossy um, offices in Neon, they have one huge office block on one side of the road on the banks of Lake Geneva for women's football. And they're building another very glossy office block for men's football. And the administrative infrastructure has just grown massively and become much more specialised. And one of the things that really drove the Women's World Cup is that FIFA realised around 86, 88 that they could trademark a number of their competitions into products. They could protect them through copyrights and they could turn them into revenue generating streams. And this is really what happens with women's football. It's not a priority. It never has been a priority. But around 86, 88, it becomes one of 12 different World Cup brands, including futsal, um, the gaming brands, beach soccer, you know, you, you, you name it. At the end of 2008, uh, FIFA had a larger membership, 208 members, than the United Nations. So it has grown exponentially in terms of the number of nations affiliated to it from about 150 in 86-88. UEFA was only formed in 1954 and tells you something about the Eurocentric nature of football in, in the same way that the, the naming of the Football <coughs> Association, when it's not even called the English Football Association, it's just the Football Association because they kind of thought that they owned the game. Um, UEFA currently has 54 members. So in order to understand the push and pull factors involved in female professional player migration into and out of Europe, we first of all have to understand how the map of European football has changed since 1945. Um, and um, this is quite a complicated graph, but it just basically gives you the idea of how UEFA grew 30 national associations as Europe has changed. Interestingly, though, European football is much larger than the EU. EU currently has 27 countries. It, you know, what is European in football and in um, uh, uh, European politics is, is quite interesting. So, uh, definitions of European identity have overlapped with other interpretations of Europeanness, such as those defined by the EU. Um, but also, the football industry defies distinct articulations of Europe. Um, so, the study had a wide agenda to critique oversimplistic notions of football as a global game. Local circumstances, regional differences, existing patterns of connectivity, parallel industries, and transnational labour markets help to shape female player experience within Europe. Um, I'll just run through very quickly some of the research questions that I had. 
And again, happy to pass the slides on to people if they thought that they were useful. Um, I wanted to critique that notion of football as a global game when 10% at best of the overall participants are women and girls. How can it be a global game? We have multi, multiple definitions of Europe, when, where and how have women and girls been represented in European football? What are the challenges of defining professionalisation in the gendered labour markets of football? And thinking also about how football labour markets are different than other labour markets in which women work. So it was really interesting talking to migration specialists who had done previous work on women's experiences of travelling around Europe as um, IT specialists and, and technicians. And some of the continuities there were in women's experiences in other industries and things that were specific to sport and, and to football. Um, and, and how do um, patterns of football's migration differ from other industries in which skilled women workers are able to sustain lucrative careers? And actually, I think some of the, some of the <coughs> ways in which we're seeing inroads into the change in football culture is women who are very high-profile lawyers, such as Moya Dodd, who is currently sitting on the FIFA um, Exco, and women who have you know, business backgrounds and other specialisms, because football can no longer be run by men in little grey blazers um, who, are, you know, have a little bit of spare time and want to hang out with their mates. It, it's a multi-billion pound industry and they need specialists. And actually, if women have qualifications in certain areas and expertise and experience of networks and sponsorship, then sometimes they can make inroads into, into that very insular industry. Uh, pretty much I wanted to tell them good news, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> so the research findings summary <laughs> are legitimate, but um, there has been an unprecedented level of connectivity amongst women active in the football industry since the 1950s. There's been greater migration, travel, networking, and digital communication. Um, and pretty much a lot of these uh, confederations and, and, and FIFA see um, Twitter and social media and that sort of connectivity as the way forward for women's football, primarily because it's cheap. And um, who is generating the content? Women's football fans or fans of women's football so you get an awful lot of free content helping to drive something that doesn't cost them an awful lot um, having said that some interesting examples of um, women players in the uh, women's super league in the uk who are digital ambassadors and that has been incredibly well organized from what i can gather um, in that these women are given worksheets, uh, weekly worksheets and with daily things that they have to do in terms of their social media use. And actually, if you look at the uh, increase in the numbers of followers for Arsenal on Twitter, for example, or the number of followers for individual women football players, there's huge potential in social media. I would perhaps argue with a note of caution that actually those of us who have been following women's football since the 90s, when the internet first came on stream, actually found one another through the internet. We were finding one another on the internet because then there wasn't the mainstream content. And I think to some extent that, that can still be um, happening. So I think we've got to be careful about help who we're speaking to and not just preaching to the converted. Um, it's about challenging some of those assumptions. And I was uh, at a, a UEFA conference in, um, I've lost track now, was it 12 or 13? Um, and uh, to chime with the uh, final of the Women's Euros in Stockholm, um, and you were still getting comments from people who work within the infrastructure of UEFA marketing guys basically who were saying well you know the easiest way for women to get more uh, attention through the media is to look sexy is there something we could do with the uniforms you know could there be more pink all of those kind of comments and they were very very much challenged from the floor 
um, as you might expect with the, with the people who were in the room. But the fact that those attitudes are still around, and that this was quite a young guy, he was in his early 20s, um, the fact that that seems to be a default thing to go to in order to promote women's sport is kind of a little bit um, depressing, especially with the amount of power that that particular person has. Um, so things that, things are changing and they are becoming interesting and, and I do think this migration work it, was really fascinating. From the 1970s you had a micro level of female professional opportunities developing globally. So you, basically uh, there were individual women like Sue Lopez and she would go to Italy and she would try and see how she got on there and then she would try somewhere else and she would try somewhere so it's very much uh, the, the individual trying to move around to, towards different lucrative labour markets, especially Italy and the US. By the time of the first UEFA tournament in 82-84, a mezzo level of migration was highlighted uh, by national women's teams becoming more integrated into football's world economy and the global game. So definitely, or, although I think it was very, very belated, um, the, things like the UEFA tournament and the Women's World Cup did give women a stage and it gave those who were interested to say, oh, well, she's pretty good and I know about somebody from another country than my own and, and so on and so forth. By the first FIFA uh, experiments with Women's World Championship in the late 1980s, a macro level of migration saw more women being able to earn full-time professional and semi-professional careers from football as players, coaches, administrators in the media, legal and corporate roles. However, the labour markets, as we know, can remain highly gendered. Uh, women players tend to cluster in specific nodes, and it's still based on things that we already know from men's football and other sports. It tends to be uh, clusters of nationality, linguistic affinity, educational opportunities, uh, and social networks. So particularly in Europe, this has been characterised as the Atlantic drift over to the US colleges which is where most players actually um, uh, aspire to be. Um, and uh, I think if you look at people like Kelly Smith, uh, the, the England player, it's been very significant in her career. Uh, and it, it was really interesting, uh, again, going back to 98, 99, interviewing, interviewing her just as she's about to go, and then interviewing um, Sue Smith, who chose not to go. And Sue Smith, if, if you see her now uh, doing her TV work and media work, she's fantastic. Uh, I think she's a great presenter. Um, when I interviewed her, she was so um, uh, shy uh, and young that she asked to be interviewed with her mum in the Adelphi Hotel so that there, it would be in public and she would have people around. And uh, it, it's been kind of interesting to see her, her, her confidence grow. Um, we can also see evidence of different patterns of migration in the study. You get an awful lot of curiosity tourism, um, short-term casual contracts, one season or less, may, maybe better clusters movement. Um, you get a lot of short-term migration, one season or more, often motivated by improved conditions and more lucrative contracts. Mid-term migration, two to five years, often related to educational programmes and an elite player's career as they're offered longer term contracts, and then long term migration, five plus years, where the degree of cultural transfer includes advanced language skills, change of nationality, ownership of property or business, relationship to children with dual nationality, blah, blah, blah. So it can have a huge effect on the individual. If you can, if you can bear with me, I am drawing to a close. The um, case study that I most uh, <laughs> often like to cite at this stage is a Scottish woman, Rose Riley. Um, who uh, slightly younger than Sue Lopez um, and she initially tries to get into a boys team by cutting her hair very short and that lasts for a while. Uh, she wants to play professional football um, um, but when she's identified as a girl she can't play with the boys after age of 11 in England as it is, as it is in that time and um, she starts to play with the local um, women's team, goes to Italy and uh, Rose Riley, if you Google Rose Riley, she's in the Scottish uh, Football Hall of Fame. Um, she's very blonde, she's very attractive, she's very much, you know, full of life force. Uh, she, she, she's a character. So she went down very well in Italy. And she ends up not only playing professionally in Italy, 
She has a fallout with a Scottish manager who she thinks is too amateur. She's banned from the Scottish national team, so she goes back to Italy, takes Italian citizenship, um, plays for, for, for years in uh, local teams. She goes on to captain the Italian national side in the unofficial Women's World Cup, uh, where she wins the golden boot. She appears in uh, ice cream advertisements. She sets up a little sports shop. <coughs> she meets her husband out there. She has a daughter out there. She speaks Italian. And she only comes back to Scotland when um, her mother falls ill and, and, and needs looking after. Uh, and unfortunately for historians, uh, leaves a lot of her stuff in a lockup in Italy where it's very difficult to get to. Um, so uh, that's material that we'll probably never see again. But the point that I'm making uh, in talking about Rose Riley is this football changed her life and she was able to pursue her dream and to live as she, she wanted to live. She also, to some extent, changed the local culture because when she is the captain of the Italian national team, um, her teammates think that as a form of affection, rather than singing the Italian national anthem at the tournament, they will sing God Save the Queen, <laughs> not realising that Rose would rather them sing Rose of Scotland. Um, so it was meant to be a compliment, but it didn't kind of turn out that way. So um, in, in conclusion then, I want to be a bit provocative in my closing comments. Um, as we move from Women's World Cup in Germany 2011 to an expanded 2014 Women's World Cup in Canada 2015, we can see that increasing numbers of women from a variety of national backgrounds can earn a living full-time as a professional player. Some, like Mia Hamm, maybe Hope Solo, maybe Marta, um, have drawn attention to uh, broader aspects of women's football within the cultural industries. Marta in particular has drawn attention to the neglect of girls and women in the context of wider social and economic problems that provided a backdrop to the Men's World Cup in Brazil in 2014. Um, and therefore, a wide and challenging research agenda remains. Uh, and I recently spoke to a young woman called, from Canada, uh, Chiara McCormack, who um, I personified as, as basically one of, uh, uh, she, she commutes more or less through football across the Atlantic. Uh, I think she has four master's degrees. So she will go to an educational institution and study for a master's, but really what she wants to do there is play soccer. Uh, and she combines education with this kind of soccer career. Uh, I think she has Irish, her Irish heritage as well as Canadian heritage and she seems to have a lot of contacts also in Scandinavia. So if you follow her Twitter feed, which I recommend you do, you will see her basically crisscrossing the Atlantic to play football. So the path is not always very clear for individual women, that they can be a one club, one team, you know, career player. That's, that's relatively unlikely, but, but there are more, um, more examples to, to explore. It's also getting really interesting to talk about what, a, what I think of as the transitioning generation. So if you look at the women uh, from the um, uh, 99ers um, who were part of the US women's national team who won that tournament, it's interesting what they're now doing with their lives, both to promote soccer and healthy living and uh, sport around children. Um, so you get these kind of transitioning careers, and that is developing into different routes too. Uh, so I hope today, uh, in, in setting that agenda, I've talked about some historical uh, and other things. I also hope today that we can debate some of the elephants in the room that the current governing bodies of world sport do not want to highlight. In so doing, I hope you'll join me in drawing attention to how narratives of constant progress and women's football catching up the male game mask wider inequalities. Women's football appears not to have a significant history, and this enables FIFA and other world governing bodies to effectively infantilise women's contribution in football to the recent, the second rate, and in need of protecting. You may wish to ask me some questions. However, I'd like to ask you some questions too. Uh, what are your opinions about the gendered labour markets of football in terms of male and female players? 
at the elite adult level? Should we have the binary implied in the language I've used in my presentation today of men's football and women's football? Isn't it, at the end of the day, just football? Uh, why are these gender binaries so policed in sport and who benefits? Just as importantly, who does not benefit? How might ancillary roles like coaching, refereeing, medical professionals, player agents, spiritual guidance, pastoral roles and administrative functions also become gendered in the current system and how might that change? Why are there so few women leaders in world football and how can they be made more visible? Is this the best way to determine the female contribution? How can we make sport more humane and inclusive? And what role does soccer have in this? And I will say, I have no answers to these questions. <laughs> these are genuine questions. Um, I've given my view at some length today and in the books and articles. But I also recognise the limitations that I've got a Eurocentric white British viewpoint and I would welcome your engagement in developing my thinking, uh, some of which happened over dinner last night. <laughs> it wasn't just arguing about Marta and, uh, and, and So just as the Panini stickers are part of a much longer history of cultural representation of women's football, I also hope we can see that the mediascape in which Canada 2015 takes place is as important to our understanding as sport. One of the ways in which policy can change is to understand that and to argue against an effect change in that. Thank you. So we have time for questions and discussion. Um, well, maybe I could pick up on one of the questions that you asked, how can, how can soccer serve to make us more humane or more inclusive? And um, I was just thinking of the research my students did. Um, I'm, I'm teaching the, the German section of um, Professor Dubois' class. Mm -hmm. So um, they've looked at, at the leader um, um, of... of um, uh, so they've been looking at the German team. And um, so on the one hand, we have then a player becoming um, a very out and outspoken GLBTQ supporter person. Um, on the other hand, of course, that's reinforcing the stereotype that only lesbians will play soccer. So, um, where do we see, you know, where, where and, and that is my question and we're following up. So, on the one hand, we can have a spokesperson um, for inclusivity and, and for um, um, GLBTQ issues, but, but we're reinforcing a stereotype at the same time. Um, I'm, I, I don't know that I have yeah, an answer. It's, it's not that I really have an answer to it, too. I just I was just thinking, you know, so we have, yes, we have the power of, of, of a very visible figure um, and, 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 and a positive role model, if you will. But, um, and then Paige, correct me, um, you also had looked at that people were more interested then in her getting married mm -hmm. to her partner than um, the soccer work. That, yes. Yeah. You're talking about a German player, right? Or uh, Steffi Jones. Steffi Jones. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, there's a much broader problem, isn't there, in football? I mean, I, I, I was just saying this at, at, at dinner last night. S supposedly, in the in the EPL, in the in the Premier League in in England, there is no out male player. There is no gay male player in the English Premier League, supposedly, who is currently playing. Which is mind-boggling. Which is, which is just, yeah. yeah. just mind-boggling and clearly not, <clears throat> not the case. Yeah. So there are sort of layers of um, stereotypes that we're dealing with here, and they are complex stereotypes, and they are made up of many different facets. Some of them are, I think, class-based. It's quite interesting that um, rugby union has an out male, male gay player um, and that is seen to be not a problem but traditionally the class base of rugby is much more middle class 
and 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 thinks of itself as as kind of a, a, a quite a different game than than football. So I think there are complexities of, of class and sexuality, but I also think um, you know stereotypes are just that and can be proven to be that. So um, when you look at diversity generally, those stereotypes just kind of fall apart. Uh, I had a question about the idea of um, teams or federations uh, promoting progress while masking um, inequalities because there were, I was actually following a little bit of a Twitter argument this morning. There was a large feature on the Portland Thorns of the, of the U.S. Um, League in The Guardian. And so it talked about there are so many fans there, there's so much support there, it's so wonderful, it's so great. And, you know, there are some people who are, had a problem with that article in that uh, it it's good to highlight the progress, uh, but at the same time is showing massive support, is showing progress, um, somehow saying that that is only what's legitimate. So other teams who don't have as um, many spectators or other teams who aren't affiliated with the men's team or who um, just don't have the resources of that team, are they ha somehow less legitimate? So the, imp the impetus behind federations or, or teams wanting to focus on progress rather than, you know, the what they need to do or this, the inequalities that they need to try to bridge is for the broader population, if you can put forward something that's successful, that's how they feel like they have to legitimize it to the broader population, if that makes sense. So it's not that they're saying we're so great, it's that if you, if you want to have the broader population who maybe doesn't right now accept women's soccer, you show them this example of things, you know, a sold out friendly at Wembley, you show them all these things and then it becomes legitimized and then, you know, you have more than 800 people at an Arsenal women's FAWSL match. So I was just wondering about like the different, if you thought like maybe there were multiple um, reasons why you focus on the progress, not just that you don't want to admit your own shortcomings, but also that in order to legitimize it more broadly, you highlight success, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Um, I suppose it's one of those um, tensions between um, sport development. I mean, well, we could sit here and have a conversation about what is FIFA for? <laughs> what is the FA for? Yeah. And one of the things that they, regardless of what we think they're for, they see themselves as, therefore, the development of sport, that particular sport, and uh, the narrative that they will often use is pr to protect that sport against evils and ills that they see coming from, from all, all different directions. Um, and so, the, quite clearly, the narrative of progress is part of what they do. It, it, it's very much something that drives them, because they want to tell themselves a constant story that, yeah, we're doing a good job, we are developing our sport, and look, increasing numbers are, um, uh, of women and girls are taking up this sport, so we, we're putting a lot of money into it, and yeah, that's, that's great. To some extent, yeah, that's legitimate because that's that's what they're there for. But it's the regulation element. It's the uh, the thing that makes me uneasy and a lot of people from my generation uneasy is um, before they before the FA, for example, <coughs> would have anything to to do with women's football. There was the creation of the Women's Football Association, which was, which was kind of loosely affiliated to to the Football Association, but but, but largely self self governing. When the Football Association decided to take over um, football in 1993, everything is centralised. So it had been run through regional leagues and this, that and the other. And so the, the players on the ground, as it were, the people who give up hours and hours as volunteers and administrators and actually make the thing happen, um, suddenly lose control. And it's very much a one-way street of this is how we're going to develop women's football. And in, in my mind, the most recent article that I've written uh, is, has been for um, Brenda's book, um, which is basically to look at the 1980s as a pivotal decade in that regard, because you've got very strong independent women's teams, like uh, the Doncaster Bells, slightly northern, very working class, slightly problematic, you know, they like a few beers and they, they would have a bit of a fight at the end of a game. And, uh, <laughs> Not the things that the Southern FA really want for women's football, which is like Arsenal 
It's affiliated to a men's club. It's integrating women's football with their other activities. Very, very respectable, southern-based, very corporate. <coughs> and the thing that <laughs> sort of makes those of us who are around then and remember these changes a little bit uneasy is, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, and it's almost like the people who made the thing happen at the time have been disregarded in favour of we should be going after this particular model. I, I don't know the um, team that, that you're speaking about, and I don't know if it speaks to that example. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it definitely does really. I was just wondering the idea of, uh, I, I think there's still a lot of work trying to be done to make women's soccer palatable to like a broader um, audience. And so I think that people approach that in different ways, and I think um, the argument that was taking place on Twitter um, is the idea of, you know, because the U.S. is foreign, so, you know, the Guardian's readers, um, are they presenting that singular view of, honestly, an exception within the league to say this is what women's soccer is in the United States. This is why we're legitimate. We are legitimate because we have 13,000 people. Um, so it, the follow-on to that is I, I hope that I'm, I work with the Washington Spirit. Um, you know, we have a tremendous facility that, you know, couldn't even fit that many people, but we have about three to 4,000 people at every single game, good, strong attendance, um, great players who went to the playoffs last year. Um, we're not less legitimate because we don't have the specific um, environment that is, that is in Portland, that is very unique. So I think that was kind of just <coughs> an angle of, um, you know, are we, are, is a team only legitimate because they have a lot of um, fans? Are they only legitimate because... Um, they're affiliated with the men's team, so I, I think it's on. The, it's just like different ways. Of yeah, <clears throat> and I think if you look at Europe uh, again, when I was when I was doing the, this study, if you look at some of the most um, successful of the European women's teams, they're independent women's teams, and they're self-conscious as so, and um, people like to support that. Um, there are other um, teams that are affiliated to to men's sides who are very successful, and some people like to support that. Um, and then there are there are teams that are sort of hybrids. Um, that, that are almost community-based teams um, and, and may be affiliated to a men's team at kind of arm's length, um, but nevertheless trying to create a, uh, an alternative uh, identity. <coughs> and some people like to, to support that. So I think just the point is that <clears throat> there, is, there is no one model in the same way that there's no one model of a men's football team. Kind of why would you expect there to be? Well, just... I love that point about in Washington you have a different maybe culture to that club than they do, but it's almost at a point where not one specific model, but it's almost at the point where we're trying to convince people that there is any model that's applicable. So you could say, point at the Portland model and say, it's almost like you're convincing, well, the more people they have, it's legitimate. Like I just had this conversation yesterday with the U.S. Customs Office who asked why I was traveling to the U.S. I'm like, we're confident I'm in soccer. And he's like, why? Like, you know, one watches it. I'm like, no, actually, like you mentioned, when we sold out for the final, like there was a bit over 30,000 people watching that final match. So he's like, oh, and if that's the argument it takes to convince this guy, I'm not saying I'm going to convince this guy to anything really, but that, you know, it could just say, well, look to all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are watching. So there is so much. It's like there's not even a nuanced view of why it's important or why are women playing. We're not even there yet. It's get it's such at a base level still for some people that there are other people watching. Everyone's doing it, so you should do it too. I had a totally like specific question, and so this may be very short, depending. Um, and it's really related to the um, research that you've been doing on migration and players. Yeah. Did you talk to um, like Nigerian players playing in Europe at all? Or uh, so I say this as somebody who's kind of like been super interested in that team, and yeah. especially from like about I guess like six six around six or seven years ago, uh, when there was the, contra well, I don't want to say controversy, but problems in the team and change in management, and then Cynthia Uwak got dropped from the squad, and I was always like, did you talk to any of them? Or No, I, di I didn't get to, to talk to any of them. Um, I, I suppose the, um, <laughs> I had the weird experience, um, the, the, the weird experience of interviewing Gao Hong, uh, the goalkeeper from the uh, Chinese national women's team in Stratford upon Avon, uh, which was just totally weird. Why would you even think that that would 
happen in your life. But um, she was doing her coaching badges in, in oh. Worcester, oh, wow. uh, at the University of Worcester, and just happened to be there. And um, I was introduced to a coach who was working at, at Birmingham City Women's. So I introduced her, but it, it, it was incredibly, it was incredibly difficult getting hold of individual women, um, and certain um, certain football associations were not ever so helpful. Even though I was sitting at the UEFA congresses and the the so-called Kiss conferences that they have on women's football, uh, trying to get, I, I would love to have got um, a Russian player, for example, to to speak to me. Um, so no, I didn't, but I I, I would have loved to. Um, and I think, I think there's some interesting parallels with other migration work that is happening, uh, particularly, I don't know if you know the um, special edition by Michelle Sykes that she did. She's uh, done a lot of work with um, African marathon runners. Oh. Um, and um, she published a, a special edition of a journal. And, and again, very interesting parallels where, with women's football, you realise the, the, the tensions in a team game as opposed to an individualistic sport as such. And, and, the, and the, real, the real developments that, are, that there have been in marathon running for women, that you, oh, okay, Paula Radcliffe is, is Paula Radcliffe perhaps the only um, female millionaire from running marathons? I don't know, but certain, be, yeah. Yeah, but certain women can have very lucrative careers and it's and it can be a real pull for a lot of those African women to move to either to Europe or the US to pursue a, a career in running. Um, and it will be fascinating to see whether there are those same opportunities in and around football. Yeah, I mean, I partly got interested in the, in the Nigerian women's team because when I was playing with the Hackney Women's Club, we had numbers of Nigerian players playing with us and they were amongst the best players. And so it meant it created kind of just at least on that within that team an interest in how in like ni the Nigerian women's side and just sort of following the Nigerian women's side. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I've just been kind of because like I think you know from a distance and with just like curiosity, like I'm on their Facebook pages and whatnot, you know, like. But um, all these pl Nigerian players um, were really um, who must have interesting migration stories, and I've just been I don't know anyway. So that's just more more questions without answers, I guess. So. Yeah, I I think some of the. Some of the first um, African players are just gonna, have just been signed this year in the Women's Super League. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I would like to do is, is to talk to to talk to those players. Um, I, I went out in 1998 to the um, Second World Women in Sport Conference in Namibia um, because I wanted to understand when I was doing the PhD, I, I'd done a little bit of work in the US, and okay, if I can understand soccer in England, if I can understand soccer in one of the world's wealthiest countries, what is what is women's soccer like in one of the world's poorest countries? You know, where, where there are all kinds of other problems, let alone wanting to have a kickabout. And, um, you know, I thought that that was uh, an absolutely fascinating experience. And I think, again, one of the reasons why I'm slightly hesitant uh, in, in some in sometimes being cynical about the developments that we've made, I think it's difficult to disprove that certainly in terms of infrastructure, a lot of the African nations now have more opportunities to play in terms of permanent um, HQ and you know facilities and so on and so forth than they've ever had before. And I think that there are a generation of young women. We, we trained one at, at, at my university um, on what's, what's called the FIFA Masters and she's from Namibia and she went back as a professional administrator to improve the status of women's soccer there. Um, and those kind of things are, are happening even though slow seems and change seems painfully slow generally. Uh, I just have a question about uh, like the ancillary roles we were talking about. Um, I saw like two weeks ago the NFL was hired as first female you know, referee, mm -hmm. and that was actually the first time I I realized that there were only male referees. Uh, I was pretty surprised. I feel like it's just you take something for granted because you you kind of categorize like referees just in its own own like image, just because everyone hates the referees and stuff. <laughs> and the reaction from the NFL has been like largely positive yeah. that they're taking these steps to hiring female referees. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any like, are there any like 
is it, is, is it just like a lack of interest why there aren't a lot of female referees, or is, are there like sort of barriers, or is it just like a press? Okay, I, I couldn't speak too much about the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I know about the NFL, we could probably be right on the back of a stamp. But um, <laughs> talking about referees in, in, in general and these kind of female, female ancillary roles, um, it is, um, well, sometimes if there are so many barriers, why would you? Mm -hmm. Why would you put yourself through that? Um, and there uh, has been a very um, recent survey by um, a network uh, in England called Women in Sport. And um, some of the um, uh, YouTube videos that they have posted as a result of their survey are completely appalling. I mean, I'm talking about highly trained female doctors running on the pitch to treat uh, an injured player and just getting awful abuse shouted at them. Horrendous, horrendous abuse. Uh, th this is... Uh, from Chelsea? From Chelsea, yeah. 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 So, um, <clears throat> why would you? Yeah. Why would you put yourself through that? If, if, you're a, if you're a highly trained female doctor, why wouldn't you go off and do something else? So, uh, one of the things that sports often realise is, is oh, that they, they have a problem and that they need to change. The difficulty with having one female referee yeah. is that you've only got one, mm -hmm. uh, and she consequently has to run around representing the whole of kind. Mm -hmm. So if she does something wrong, that's mm -hmm. that's how women would do it, uh, you know, for people who are looking at stereotypes. So uh, I think the key thing is um, that there has to be, you know, a weight of, of women. There has to be. Uh, enough women coming through, you would hope the NFL are training more young women to mm -hmm. become referees yeah, so that right. she's the first of a generation. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't always happen. And I think we saw that in England with um, uh, uh, Hope Powell as the England women's national team coach. You know, she was very much um, heralded as the first woman with her uh, UA for A pro, li pro license. And um, now she's gone. Who is there to follow and what's happened to hope so um individual women not always mm -hmm. you know it, it's it's a great first but it's not always a great step forward for the sport yeah. I have a question. Um, so the first image that you presented of women playing soccer not the first image that you presented but the first possible image of women playing uh -huh. soccer from 1869 yeah. That could have easy, easily been organized or could have just been a pickup game. And I'm kind of curious about, so most of your work is on, or that you've presented is on sort of institutionalized work. And I was wondering how you might see the sort of limitations of, of looking at women's sport as institutionalized, um, as validated or not by the FA or validated or not by FIFA, and sort of what the parallel trajectory of informal participation um, could look like in terms of the, the analysis that you presented here about progress or lack of progress and how do we how do we understand the parallel ways that women either spectate and professionally play soccer or play soccer as amateurs or aficionados? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's a great question, um, and and it's perhaps the most difficult issue to to answer. But um, the the way that I usually answer it is. Um, that I only treat the voices of FIFA and UEFA and the FA as they are reflected in minute books and papers and documents and what have you as, as one voice or one series of voices, often a, a very confused set of voices. Um, but if you go to speak to the players, you have another set of voices. If you look at different ways in which women's football is represented, in different cultural artifacts, you've got a whole different set of voices. And I don't privilege the so-called institutional voices any more highly than I do any of the others. If anything, I'm probably inclined towards, um, you know, wanting to talk to the players and what they think they're doing. Um, and, and that's really how I started with the oral histories. Um, and I've just become more and more interested, as you probably gathered, in this object-based research um, because I guess I would like to think of how it's passed into to popular culture mm -hmm. because there seems to be a perception that 
you know, like the Panini stickers are new. Just, yeah, to some extent they are new. <clears throat> but they're not new in terms of this longer cultural history. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that always strikes me, you know, walking around in, in, in Britain is that you know about men's football even if you don't want to. If you're, if you're um, you know, going to hospital in Leicester, you'll see the signs for Leicester City, you'll see little local boys' um, teams' names, and you can't help but know about football. If you want to know about women's football, you generally have to go and look. But I may be revising that viewpoint, and maybe it, it, it has been more widely represented in cultural artefacts that I'm aware of, and maybe more people will have known about it.